we're back. We're live. I'm Jay Fidel. It's 12 noon on Monday, and here we go. And we're going to do we're going to do Mino, Marco, and me. Except it's Marco and me this time, and it's about energy in Hawaii. And Marco, welcome back to the show. Well, uh, ho ho ho, and a happy Aloha Monday to you, good friend Jay Fidel. Thank you for having me on. Absolutely, always, Marco. We learned so much. So uh, let's talk about the hot news you mentioned just before the show began about Sunrun. It's very interesting on a number of levels. What happened? Well, there was a piece in the Wall Street Journal today, that bastion of, uh, of business uh, reporting owned by our friend Rupert Murdoch and Fox. And the, the news was that there were uh, uh, several former Sunrun employees, including managers, who have now gone on the record stating that they believe, uh, they felt that they were under pressure by their superiors to not report in a timely fashion, to not report cancellations of, of sales uh, in the uh, lead up to Sunrun doing an initial purchase offering an IPO in the middle of 2015, and uh, the reporter cites, uh, like I said, uh, a couple or three managers, including the manager of uh, their Hawaii operations uh, over from 20, February 2015 to February 2017. They quote him on the record in, in this Wall Street Journal piece saying that he felt uh, that he was asked essentially to hold off on reporting this uh, this essentially bad news about uh, customers who had signed up previously to go with Sunrun, uh, but who backed out in an effort to try to uh, um, boost the IPO price uh, uh, when Sunrun Sunrun went public. The fellow quoted in the in the Wall Street Journal is Darren Jennings. Darren Jennings, who says he was the regional sales manager in Hawaii, as I mentioned, from February 2015 until. February 2017. That's against the law, isn't it? Well, you're the attorney here, my friend, so you're more in a position, I think, to make a judgment on that. No, so it sounds like a material misrepresentation. Um, you know, with, with uh, due expectation that the public will rely on that rep misrepresentation. And, oh, gee, that's, that's it's, if it's not uh, criminal, it's certainly civil. And uh, not good for Sunrun. You know, these days you make a public statement. You better be. You better do your due diligence. You better be right. You better be correct. You better not be lying. Now look what happened to Volkswagen. She that really hurt Volkswagen. Right. It still is hurting Volkswagen. And now Sunrun. We have dishonesty in Sunrun. Um, not so good for Sunrun, and not so good for the the solar energy industry, and not so good for energy. As a matter of fact, we don't need scandals like this. Well, according to, to Lynn Jurich, who's the longtime Sunrun CEO and co-founder, she said in a statement, according to this piece, while not directly addressing the question of whether employees delayed reporting consumer cancellations, but said the company had, quote, reviewed the digital audit trail on our systems and turned up no evidence that our sales employees changed cancellation dates in our systems to delay the reporting of cancellations. I proudly stand by Sunrun's workplace culture, our values, and our unwavering commitment to customer satisfaction, and the principle of integrity upon which our company was founded. Well, it's not exactly black and white, is it? Well, I tell you what is black and white, Jay, is that the solar finance companies uh, have been uh, noteworthy over the years for losing a, a tremendous amount of money. It's, it's a business model that I think uh, certainly in the near term has proven by the demonstrable data has proven to be rather spectacularly unprofitable. And last year, while Sunrun had a, a peak year in terms of gross revenue, they also had a peak year in terms of losses. And according to their 10K filing with the, the SEC, uh, they lost more than 300 million with an M, 300 million dollars. So it, it kind of has led me to wonder whether there's something they know that we don't know, or um, perhaps uh, you know, are they are they the next example of the the Jeff Bezos 
Amazon model, you know, I looked, at, looked into Amazon a bit for the class I'm teaching, um, my energy politics class at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And you know, Bezos started Amazon in 1994, 1994, way before the digital marketplace became the monster that it is now, right? Mm -hmm. And for 15 years, Bezos lost money each and every year. Amazon lost money. And since now we're, you know, eight years past 2009, 15 years after 2000, uh, 1994, uh, Amazon has become profitable. So uh, are these solar finance companies perhaps going down optimistically, going down a similar direction where they lose money, lose money, lose money year after year, but then at some point they, they do a, the crossover from the red to the black and they start making money? I don't know. I mean, one of the biggest companies around with a global footprint, company that I was well familiar with when they started way, way back when was Sun Edison. And Sun Edison, of course, failed spectacularly last year, imploded, as well as a number of other solar finance companies have gone similar direction. So it's, it's just kind of a, a mystery to me how you can, how a company, how a business model can continue to lose such dramatic and accelerating amounts of money and yet still continue doing what they do. I just, uh, I, I don't have an answer to that. I've talked to a number of my colleagues over the years and there's a fair amount of head scratching going on, but what's clear is that there is uh, has been up until now substantial financial backing from from institutions and from the usual uh, sources of hundreds of millions of dollars of funding. You know, you can't continue to lose money unless you have new money coming in, right? Unless you're printing it yourself. Yeah. And of course, that's the federal. I would draw offense, a big so. distinction between um, you know Sunrun and uh, uh, Sun Edison and and um, Amazon. I mean, Amazon, uh, you know, had and still has, in my opinion, a, a huge market that it hasn't yet fully tapped. And it has technology that it hasn't yet fully, you know, developed and exploited. So there's a long way to go. And if I were an investor and Amazon came to me, uh, even though it was losing money, I would, I would invest on the prospect of what's going to happen in the future. You know, exploring that market, expanding into new markets, and, ex you know, developing new technology that makes it faster and more efficient and cheaper to operate. But in the case of, uh, in the case of solar, the, uh, you know, the solar cells are what they are. Um, you know, the equipment around them is pretty much stable, I think. You can talk more about that. Um, there's no, you know, r dramatic new technology in the pipeline, really. Um, there's no dramatic new uh, market to, to expand into. Um, and, uh, you know, the Chinese are expanding into it, but I, I don't know if we have the market. So all the low-hanging fruit has been, or much of it has been taken. So if I were an investor and they came to me and said, uh, you know, we're losing money, but, um, you know, look at the, the prospects, I would say, what prospects? And therefore, you know, um, I, I, it, 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 it suggests to me that we ought to discuss what is wrong with the model. The model, you know, essentially is, is flawed because it doesn't, it's not profitable. But, but <clears throat> what can be done to improve the model to make it profitable? Or is, is this whole thing, you know, going to implode? Not just one or two companies, but everything. Uh, indeed, uh, you know, the solar and solar companies here in Hawaii haven't done well either. And you can't say um, that it's the fault of the government. Um, you can say that uh, with the government they did better. Um, but, but right now, the, the business model here seems to be flawed also. Comments? Well, of, of course, as you know, I have a very vested interest in, in the solar industry here being uh, an owner of a solar company here on the Big Island, a portable take installation, design installation engineering company. And I'm not uh, sharing any great pearls of wisdom when I say that any company needs a certain amount of volume to pay expenses, a certain amount of volume in terms of revenue, right? And as well, not just revenue, but profitability, that you're making something uh, more than what you're putting out in terms of expenses. And the contractors who have largely focused not on uh, solar PPAs, power purchase agreements, or solar leasing, uh, those who are selling essentially cash systems or systems where the homeowner is financing themselves, I think most of us have been relatively healthy. But 
up until now, but the, the big but is that, as I mentioned, that requires a certain volume, a certain revenue. And if you look at the, the PV permit numbers, which I, I crunch on a regular basis, I mean, the numbers are, uh, so far this year, first four or five months of this year, have taken a very steep dive compared to the previous uh, period last year. And last year was uh, a steep dive, the worst year in terms of, uh, of the PV industry uh, compared to the previous five or six years. So there's a fair amount of pain going on there. I'm, I'm feeling it. My colleagues are feeling it. And the big question mark is uh, what kind of revenue, what kind of demand for our products and our, and, uh, on our systems can we reasonably expect in the months to come? And with all the kind of uh, bubbling uncertainty on the regulatory side as far as these various dockets uh, before our commission, such as the Distributed Energy Resources docket or DER docket, uh, what's coming after NEM? I mean, that energy metering was done away with October of 2015, although it's, it's died a long and, and long and long and long lingering death. There were, a lot of us are still installing NEM systems, but that's, that's going to end sooner rather than later. So what is it that we can offer in terms of interconnect agreements and in terms of value for uh, for this new frontier where it's battery storage, battery storage, battery storage. And uh, there's just, uh, you know, in the 17 years I've been doing this here, Jay, there's, I think, more turbulence now in the air and the needing to, uh, to buckle one seat belt tight and not get bonked around uh, is, is, is greater than ever. Well, you know, it strikes me that, uh, you know, in, in, in what you say is a call for the industry to reinvent itself not necessarily with pushing legislation through, although that could help next year, you know, to expand the uh, battery storage tax credit. Um, but, you know, some other mm, creative, innovative twists on how to do solar, how to install solar, how to maintain, how to finance solar, um, how to, you know, find new technology to make it better. Um, so maybe the, energy, the, the uh, solar installa installer uh, industry has to reinvent itself. I'd be interested in your thoughts about what it could do, what you could do, what you might think about doing uh, in order to do that. Well, there are a number of companies uh, across the state that are looking, have been looking to and have actually have been diversifying into other fields, including uh, doing PV, AC, where you have photovoltaic system, small PV system that is powering a, a DC-driven uh, compressor, AC compressor, and a system like that does not e need utility approval because it doesn't act with, interact with the utility power at all. And there's energy efficiency uh, that is uh, part of, uh, can be part of a product lineup uh, doing energy audits for people's homes, showing them where they can save energy by changing out light bulbs or getting new appliances and so forth. So there's no shortage of creative other means to try to generate revenue, Jay. What is of, of concern is that all this other, all these other avenues are rather manini, are rather small in terms of the revenue stream per sales transaction uh, compared to selling twenty, fifty, one hundred thousand dollar or more photovoltaic systems, so that's where it's a real challenge as a business owner is to you, you know I have to decide what's worth the, my time, what's worth the the time and energy of my staff in terms of ancillary products other than our bread and butter. Uh, portable take system design and installation. And yeah. Well, with 17 years of experience, Marco, and you've seen the landscape evolve and change kaleidoscopically over those years. Uh, you followed it closely, you've crunched the numbers and so forth. But I'd like to give you a hypothetical. I walk into your office, and I'm a young fella in my 20s, millennial. I have some capital, maybe my father gave me capital, or I had some capital from some source, and I want to get into business. And I ask you straight up, Marco, should I get into the solar installer business, yes or no? Oh, boy. Don't answer that question, yeah. Marco. We're going to take a break. And I'll give you one minute to think about your answer, tick, 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 and then we'll be right back. 
That's Marco Mangelsdorf here on Mina, Marco, and Me. We'll be right back. Match day is no ordinary day. The pitch, hallowed ground for players and supporters alike. Excitement builds. Game plans are made with responsibility in mind. Celebrations are underway. Ready for kickoff, MLS clubs and our supporters rise to the challenge. We make responsible decisions while we cheer on our heroes and toast their success. Elevate your match day experience. If you drink, never drive. Okay, we're back, we're live. I'm Jay Fidel. This is Mina Marco and me on Energy on Monday. And we left the cliffhanger. The young fellow walks into Marco's office, wants to talk to the guru, wants to know whether he should get into the business at this point in time. Marco, what's your answer? Well, I think uh, selfishly I would say no, because uh, I'd just assume there would not be any more competition than I'm already dealing with. But on a less uh, selfish basis, uh, I think I would also have to say that uh, it's not uh, particularly uh, blossoming or optimistic time right now to be in this line of business, which, as I've written about over the past month a number of times, you know, runs counter to the overall macro global trends and what's going on in the U.S. mainland of uh, PV reaching uh, you know, multiple new gigawatt, uh, gigawatt records in terms of deployment over the previous, uh, the previous calendar year. So uh, uh, Hawaii is not, uh, I think, a really booming market uh, right now, any of the islands in particular. So I guess the answer would be uh, to that, to, to the young Jay Fidel who were to walk in to my office uh, asking that question, I would have to say uh, I would probably dissuade them from uh, taking that leap. Yeah. Maybe there's another co time coming soon. Maybe there'll be some disruptive technology either in or around the, uh, the panels themselves. Maybe that would change things. And, and make it uh, more profitable. But <clears throat> let's, uh, let's go to the, the next point in our agenda, Marco. There was a remarkable thing that happened on Friday, just Friday, I think, and that was the appointment of a missing PUC commissioner. What happened? Well, uh, just to take uh, people back a couple weeks, uh, Tom Gorak was uh, acting as interim PUC commissioner going back from uh, what July 1 of last year up until uh, April, uh, was it April 30th, or excuse me, May, uh, May 5th, I believe, of this year when the session, the, uh, the, uh, the legislative session ended in Honolulu. Uh, Tom Gorak, being an interim appointee, uh, he uh, was rejected as, as fulfilling the rest of that, that particular term on the commission. They're typically six-year terms, if I'm not mistaken. He was rejected by a majority vote in the Senate, so he lost his job. Um, and the governor spent uh, a little bit of time looking at other candidates, and he announced on Friday that he was uh, nominating Jay, uh, also known as James, but uh, to his friends Jay Griffin, to that, uh, that appointment. And uh, I think uh, very, very highly of Jay. I think he's a real, real sharp guy, real good guy. And uh, I was expecting the likelihood of the governor choosing one of uh, more one or more uh, attorneys there in Honolulu who is uh, steeped somewhat in regulatory matters and uh, as far as I'm concerned he he went out of the box on this one uh, David Ige did and he, he hit one out of the park to kind of mix my metaphors a bit with, uh, with the appointment of <laughs> out of the of box out of the park what have you <laughs> there you well, go what's what there is Jay go. Griffin's background uh, he was with uh, he was with the PUC and he's with the Hawaii uh, Natural Energy Institute too so uh, where does he come from what's his training experience well, he was with HNEI for I'm not sure how long, and he's, he's now with HNEI until he actually takes the oath uh, of his position, which uh, hasn't taken place yet, but will happen, I believe, within the next couple of weeks or so. Uh, that said, he was on loan, if I'm not mistaken, from HNEI, the Hawaii Natural Energy Institute, to the commission over the course of the uh, next era HEI 
uh, acquisition hearings because I remember seeing Jay there, uh, Jay Griffin, day in, day out, even though I wasn't there day in, day out, uh, for those 22 days of hearings there at the Blaisdell. So he was hired by the commission to do, uh, well, you know, a short-term stint there in terms of aiding the commission in the, in the process of evaluating whether it was in the public interest uh, to approve that uh, proposed acquisition. Uh, after the merger was uh, turned down without prejudice by the commission by a vote of two to nothing with Randy uh, Iwase and Lorraine Akiva voting against and, and Gorak uh, abstaining, uh, he went back to HNEI. He has uh, a PhD, so I feel some affinity and uh, felt sympathy for anybody who's done that grind, having done one myself uh, a number of years ago. I don't know the exact field, but he, he knows... Uh, the, the regulatory field uh, inside and out. I believe that he is a uh, strong supporter of the governor's goals of uh, uh, greater and greater energy independence uh, over the years and decades. So uh, I think he just uh, uh, represents a very, uh, very good choice uh, and uh, hopefully will bring a new energy and dynamism to, uh, to a commission uh, of, uh, with Randy and, and Lorraine. Yeah, it sounds like a shot in the arm, actually. Uh, but do we know how he feels about LNG? Do we know how he feels about the technology? HNEI is all about technology. Um, any information on that level? That I do not know. That I do not know. I just uh, what I do know about his uh, his, his support of renewable energy, uh, which of course is almost universal in this state, and you know, we'll just have to uh, to see how. How things play out. It'll also be interesting whether uh, there, there are a number of, of kind of hot pending topics and issues that weren't completed or really satisfied when the legislature ended their term earlier this month. I mean, rail is one of them. Uh, is it conceivable that there would be a special session of uh, the House and the Senate to come back into session in order to address the uh, the, the issues that did not get perhaps resolved adequately, and and again, I'm not a, a not a specialist in terms of Senate rules or the procedure, but is it conceivable that uh, they could come back into session and rather than have someone like Jay Griffin be be an interim, you know, just uh, discuss whether they uh, the the first the, the the consumer protection. Consumer Health was the Health and Consumer Protection Committee under the Senate under Senator Rosalind Baker. Uh, whether that's something that they would take up uh, the nomination of Jay Griffin to be PUC commissioner sooner rather than later, and that's again that I have no inside information on that, but that's something that certainly comes to my mind. Is yeah, to, I mean uh, it comes to my mind too that if they're going to have a special session, this is uh, one confirmation they could actually handle. I believe with you in short order because he is. Um, you know, generally held in high regard. He probably will be confirmed. Uh, there's nobody speaking against him, at least not yet. And for that reason, if they, if they put it to a vote, he'd probably get confirmed right away. So it wouldn't take a lot of time. Um, but the question is, you know, what A, whether there will be a special session, because right now that's very iffy, and, and B, if there is a special session, whether it will be focused on the specific needs for the special session. And that probably would be, um, you know, tax and rail. Um, but you know, the other thing is that um, we know it's not critical that he get confirmed right now. It could wait. It could wait till, you know, the regular session in, in 2018, just as it waited for Tom Gorak. The irony is that Gorak was awaiting confirmation he didn't get. And in this case, we have the same thing a year later, a guy appointed, you know, outside the regular session who, who probably will have to wait until next year to get confirmed. Does that affect the operation of the PUC? Well, it's important to note that whether you are a, I mean, there's no such thing, of course, as a permanent commissioner, but whether you're there with a full term ahead of you, however many years are left from that term, that six-year term, or whether you're so-called interim, uh, it doesn't affect your your status as a commissioner. I mean, you are a full commissioner unless and until you're no longer a commissioner. So there's not kind of uh, pending or junior or probationary commissioner status. I mean, once Jay Griffin is sworn in, I mean, he, he joins uh, uh, Mr. Wase and Ms. Akiba on the same 
on the same level. So it, it doesn't matter, I guess, practically speaking, uh, for the next months to come, what, whether he has an interim in his title or not. But I guess, uh, I mean, if, if I were him, I think, or, or anybody who were nominated, I, I'd rather get that interim part uh, off of my title uh, or off of my, my uh, off of my my subject line sooner rather than later. Sure, I mean, that only sure. makes sense, right? But let me let me uh, ask this, uh, Marco. You know, you got you got uh, Randy Wasse, a lawyer, a legislator, um, been around the block in politics. Uh, Lorraine Akiba, a lawyer, and to some extent been around the block in politics. But neither of them, prior to coming with the PUC, were specialists, experts in energy. Um, and they both learned, you know, like when they got appointed. Um, but uh, Jay, Jay Griffin, is, is a different kettle of fish altogether. He's seeped in it, as you said, he has a PhD in energy policy. Um, he's been with the, you know, with core organizations dealing with energy policy for some time. Um, and he's presumably totally familiar with energy policy and with energy technology at HNEI. And that's a completely different orientation. And it suggests that the makeup of this three person PUC commission uh, will change, that the weight of it will change uh, more, if, you know, assuming they all have a voice, uh, more toward, you know, um, policy considerations, I mean, long-term policy considerations such as you have uh, at HNEI, um, and, uh, and technology such as you have at HNEI. He's a different kettle of fish, and it will be, I suggest to you, that it will be a different kettle of fish with him on board. Do you think so? I do, Jay, and I really hope that's the case because uh, uh, Mike Champley brought a lot to the table, I thought. Mike was from the energy industry, but more on the utility side. So, uh, and, and previous commissioners, uh, you know, those Carl Caliboso, John Cole. I'm trying to think uh, going back over time, uh, was, has there been anybody who has the, the kind of cred and the bona fides uh, in terms of I know a very deep and broad knowledge of, of energy issues uh, uh, prior to, to Jay Griffin, and I think he may be, he may be new in that regard, uh, or, or our new type of commissioner that comes with that kind of really deep portfolio. So I can only hope that that's something that, uh, that will make a, uh, and I expect it to make a positive difference as the commission wades through uh, so very, very much on his plate. Well, Marco, I, I agree with you. It was a good appointment by David Ige. Uh, this, this one uh, should get some real traction, and it should be uh, beneficial to the commission and therefore um, to the energy you know, community. Um, and I'm happy that it happened, and I, I suggest, uh, I surmise that you are too. Uh, so let's, let's be optimistic about this one, eh? Yes, and let's, uh, let's reach out to, to Jay sooner rather than later. So we can get JJ, JJ and Marco on uh, for a show, eh? <laughs> there you go, JJ and Marco. Well, thank you, Marco. It's been great. It always is great to talk to you on, on energy on Mondays, and I will look forward to talking with you again two weeks from now. And hopefully, Mina Marita can also join us then. Thank you so much, Marco. Always my great pleasure. Mahalo, Nui, my friend. Aloha.